And now it's time for our theme song. Will you all stand with me, please? Okay, so let's, we'll move on with our program. Our special music today is going to be by Jerry L., Joshua, and Joy Ozeda. Our prayer will be by Ron and Tatiana and Eliana Meinhart. And our speakers today are Scott and Cami Ritzema. He fed a thousand people 
Let us kneel for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can be gathered together on this Sabbath day, a day that you delight to heal, that you delight to answer the prayers of your suppliants. And I pray, Lord, that you would please answer our prayers today. We're praying collectively, that you would heal our families, that you would allow us to catch a glimpse of that divine pattern that will bring life and rejuvenation and restoration to our homes. And so we pray that you would fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit, that the words that are spoken by the Ritzimas would not just reach us on, to, on an intellectual level, but they would truly touch our hearts and that you would drive them home until they become a part of our lives. We thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon. Wow, our ranks have grown. I was up here on Thursday, and how many of you are, we're not here on Thursday. How many of you are, are new today or yesterday? Yes, welcome. Um, I'm very happy to be back at where I can say we are going to share a message this afternoon, which is a rare, rare thing. Those of you who are, who are here on Thursday um, were subjected to a, a fire hose treatment from me. Um, Presenting an enormous quantity of information in a uh, not enormous quantity of time. This session, will, uh, it'll have a totally different feel to it. So we're going to tell a little bit of our, our story. But before I get into that, for those, a couple people came up after the message on Thursday, and there were a ton of quotes, a lot of information. If you want the PowerPoint, just email me, and, and I'll send you the PowerPoint so you can have all of those quotes. But much more importantly, we are to all study these things for ourselves and reading through those books, Child Guidance, Adventist Home, etc. cetera. But, um, but please contact me. It's beltoftruthministries.com is our, our website. And, and speaking of that, actually, somebody said uh, it, all, all that information that, that I presented on Thursday is also on some of our DVDs that are there after sundown. And somebody said to me this morning, Scott, your booth is gone. No, it's just been swapped. So it's over there. Come after, after sundown and, 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 and visit. Also, my good friend Ron Meinhardt, I appreciated the prayer and um, his booth. So many great booths here, and it's just a wonderful community that we are blessed to be a part of to guest speak at, uh, at the family retreat. So um, also, just a quick um, a business item. At the corner of each of these three back sections is, is just a blank notepad and, um, and a pen. And if, if you want to be added to the Belt of Truth Ministries newsletter, those are just going to circulate 
just, just pass them right forward, up and down the rows and, and forward. If you want to put an email address on there, just, just a simple email address is all that needs to be put on there to be added to our newsletter. We keep you updated about what's happening with our ministry. And that is all in the way of uh, announcements. So our, our message this morning is entitled, Together, Together, Together. And frankly, both of us feel the same way about being up here as parents with, a, with, with little ones. It feels silly. It feels backward. Like we want to be out there listening to the seasoned, seasoned veterans, you know, those who have been there, done that, those who have fought the good fight and finished the race. And so I, I guess this is our opportunity as we've been asked to just share some of, some of our stories, some of our, you know, you, know what, you know what a testimony is? A testimony is where you get to testify. Are, but are you testifying about yourself? No, you're testifying about what the Lord is doing. And so having said that, let's view this kind of just as like a beginning of a conversation. You're sitting down with some friends and you say, hey, what are you guys doing with your family and with your kids? We do that all the time with people our age and older and younger and all, all the above. And so let this be the beginning of that. And I know this is kind of a large forum to uh, engage in discussion. Let the discussion come. Please give us your thoughts, your feedback, your advice, especially those of you who've been around the block a couple of times. So enough said on that. We are, we are learners with you in this journey of seeking to try to conform our family pattern and standard to God's pattern and standard. The Bible says, be ready to give an answer for those who ask you about the hope that you have. So I guess this is the, the, the beginning of our, our answer as the Lord continues on our, our journey that, that he's, he's bringing us on. Well, we wanted to start out this afternoon just by giving you a little background on our family, a little background on our story. A few of you have asked our story or just questions about how did you guys do this or how did you do that? And it's always fun to just have those conversations, but now we get to have it on a bigger scale. Um, when you hear the title, Together, 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 you think, oh, they're going to talk about being together as a family, and that's great. And we are, for sure. But for us, uh, that phrase has a really deep meaning. It has a lot of um, significance for our family. It's actually our family's motto. I don't know if your family has a motto. I didn't have a motto growing up, but the Ritzema's family motto is Together, Together, Together. Now, we certainly always didn't believe in this. It's been a journey, kind of a slow one, embarrassingly to say, but it's been a slow journey, and we're certainly not there yet. We have a long ways to go, and God, um, by his grace, has it's, um, led us this far and will continue to lead us. We're going to go back in history a little bit, which is another good word, by the way. History is just his story. 2011, the birth of our first child, this was a time where we were brand new Seventh-day Adventists yet, and I didn't even, we didn't even know the book Child Guidance existed at that point, but the Lord still was, was, was impressing something upon our hearts, actually more so Cammie's heart. I'll just let her speak to that. Um, just kind of like a big leap into counterculturalism, you might call it, something that the world would look at and say, that's not how you're supposed to do it in the 21st century. Cammie made a, a, a pretty, pretty big leap from the standard American living. Well, it was a long time ago, back when we were living in California, and the first real decision that we made to put our family first and to practice that together lifestyle was when I decided that I would be, we decided that when we had kids, I would be a stay-at-home mom. Now, I know that's not a radical idea in this crowd, but our culture, of course, doesn't elevate the role of the mother. You know, we live in the land of laundry. We wipe noses full time. You know, it's not a glorious job most days. And it certainly felt radical when I was in my teaching career. You know, I, t I taught with a lot of working moms, and that's just what you did is you, you taught, then you had kids, and you kept teaching what, with your kids at home. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be home with my kids. I wanted to be with them every day. And so it wasn't a very hard decision for me to trade in my 8 to 3, Monday to Friday teaching schedule for a 24-7 teaching schedule. And now I can't imagine going back and doing the working mom thing. I get to be part of my kids' everyday life, and I'll never get these years back. I know that Paul mentioned the other night the phrase that the days are long, but the years are short. And it's so true. Somehow we have a 6-year-old. I don't know how that happened. And we have had some long hard days. But those long, hard days, those trials, those difficulties have made those short years even more rich, even more fulfilling. And I don't want to miss any of those moments. We have such a short time window with our kids, and I want to be there for every moment. 
it should it should be mentioned, of course, that every family's in a unique situation. Yeah. You know, there's the tough single mom situation. There's the we're out of work, we're in between jobs, and so to be to be sensitive with to that, God is asking us to do our absolute best in the unique situations we find ourselves in and for us that was the that was the luxury we had and, and and after coming across child guidance and then starting to read these things we were like whoa i mean we didn't even know the half of this it was kind of vindicating that decision at that point when we read that parents you are to and i won't have all the slides up this time but let me just rifle through a couple examples just paraphrasing them you are to make parenting your primary job in life make it a business Make it your life work. Invest your best time and thought into this work. It is the most important work of your life. If you think that some other calling, higher and holier, has been given to you, you are under a deception. That's a direct quote. That's, that's heavy stuff. That can sometimes slap you in the face in a good way to awaken you out of the stupor of, of, of the ruts we find ourselves in. You also read that parenting is the greatest of missionary labors, that the mother bears a greater responsibility than does the, do you know what I'm about to say? The king upon his throne. Whoa, the, ki the mother bears a greater responsibility than does the king upon his throne. And then it, it ups the ante even more. It says next to God, the mother's power for good is the greatest known on earth. The greatest power for good on earth, other than God, of course, is the mother. And then it says an angel could not ask for a higher mission. So you may have heard me say before, that makes it the order go something like this. God, then moms, then angels then the king upon his throne and everybody else down here i mean we went whoa this is a really 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 high calling and a big and a big deal so cammy's saying we're, we're going to take this this and go with it the full-time mom thing and in the end you know it, it didn't really take much to convince me that you know even when i thought about all of the me time and the perks of working and the financial boost of having two incomes all of that wasn't worth or couldn't equal the joy of staying home with our boys, and it's been worth all the sacrifices. But God wasn't done with our journey. That was just the first step. He had a lot more to teach us. In 2012, we were living comfortably in a little house in, uh, in the suburbs, in a cute little cul-de-sac. Um, Scott had a comfortable teaching job. And then he started teaching on the subject of media. And he started traveling a little bit to teach about media. And he started to travel more. Then he, we started a ministry and he put out a DVD. And in about a year's time, Scott was regularly speaking at churches on the weekends and still teaching full time. Now, of course, um, not everybody is called to uh, make a career change. But this was one of those junctures in our life where we had to ask the Lord, uh, which, which direction are we going here? Um, th this very same place last year, I, I know I shared a portion of this, but just to repeat that, there was a quotation that changed the course of my life, and that's why I, I say it multiple times. It says in the book Adventist Home, fathers, spend as much time as possible with your children. Ooh, that's a tough one when you've got a lot of passions and a lot of interests and a lot of really important things to do, right? But it convicted me that teaching full-time and being in this developing ministry thing that that something had to give here there was another quotation that said this in adventist home page 221 if he is engaged in business which almost wholly closes the door of usefulness to his family he should seek other employment which will not prevent him from devoting some time to his children and again that's unique in every situation interestingly research that's been done by the George Barna Institute, they discovered that uh, spiritually strong young adults in the churches of America today were, were most likely raised by parents who, well, meet a bunch of different, you know, uh, criteria and different, different ways that they did parenting. That's what the whole Raising the Remnant seminar that we do covers. But one of those, one of those findings was the spiritually strong young adults, by and large, were raised by parents where there was at least one full-time parent or a combination of the two and so we're going, okay, if, I, if I'm working the, the job of like two people over here, well, we want to make sure not to just have the full-time mom thing, but what usefulness am I going to have to my family if I'm gone all the time? 
So um, this was a, a step of faith. Maybe you'd say a leap of faith. Uh, wondering if this was going to be wise. Maybe you say, Scott, that sounds kind of reckless. And maybe it was at the time. But we said, um, it's time to give up the teaching thing altogether. And so I was ready to uh, have the conversation with my much more cautious than me uh, wife, who is uh, married to a uh, kind of dream, big dreams, adventurous, jump off cliffs and so on with your life style. And I was about to say, you know, Cammie, I think God is calling us um, for me to quit my, my teaching job completely, and, and we're going to sell our house, and what do you think about uh, moving out into the country and living in a paid-for mobile home and, and just getting out of the city and do, do, just, just ripping this whole Band-Aid off thing here, and we'll get into the country living thing in a second, but I was about to start that I, I, delicately. I didn't know how to go about it, but the Lord, the Lord made it a lot easier. Instead, instead it's uh, Cammy says to me, Scott, I think I've been praying about it, and I think um, the Lord wants you to quit your teaching job and pursue this speaking ministry so you can be around more for the family. So that's how it went. Handed in the letter of resignation. And then the next day, another school says, uh, we'd like to take you up part-time up here where, you, where you've moved to in the country. And I'm saying, well, no, we're leaving, we're leaving uh, teaching. But um, then at that point, uh, surprise baby number two comes along. And so that made a little more sense, uh, part-time teaching at that point. So, so the journey is continuing as you see together, 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 the theme, every step you're taking, you're wanting to make the family a more and more priority in your life. So God did open a door for Scott to teach part-time, and that all of those events that he kind of ran through transpired over, I think it was one weekend, and it was just this crazy weekend. He was supposed to go up north to be at this school, and I didn't go because I felt sick. Turns out it was morning sickness, so it was just this really neat um, situation where God was moving in our family. So God opened a door for Scott to teach part-time instead, which allowed him to travel more and be with us more, so it was kind of a win-win situation. But again, his schedule got too full again. Does anyone else notice how easy it is to get too busy? You have your work, you have your family, then you have your church commitments, then you have your extended family stuff and your to-do lists, and it just goes on and on. And there is just always so much that you can be doing. Well, Child Guidance, page 97, says, Let not a mother allow her mind to be occupied with too many things. On page 101, it says, She must allow nothing to divert her mind. Now, I'm still struggling to uh, apply all these myself, of course, but I have to remember that while I want to be all things to all people, I can't. But I am pretty much all things to my kids. Did you hear that? <laughs> I used to quote that on behalf of Cammy because she didn't speak in front of people. And I, I'd say, Cammy, what should I tell to the moms who feel like they're pulled in 100 directions? And, and she says, well, what, what, what I've felt in my life is, you know, you, you want to. You want to. You know, the church, the extended family, the sister, the, the friend, the this and this and this and this and this and this and this in life. But you can't, can I just repeat it? I know you said it so well. I just want it to be said again. You can't be all things to all people. But moms particularly, you are pretty much all things to your, particularly your small children. And moms and dads, this applies very much to, all, to, to both. You know, and, and my testimony, my story is like this. Father, spend as much time as possible with your children. And it, it's, isn't it nice when you just tell a testimony about the areas where like, you made the right decision, right? And it's just like, you're giving God's, God glory for that, but that's, that's the easy part of the testimony to tell, right? Not the part where it's like, oh yeah, you're still working too much. Oh yeah, you're still making overcommitted over here. And that's been a constant struggle for me personally. But I, I've never met an old timer, and I don't think you'll ever meet an old timer who will say this to you. I mean, you get, I hope you do get advice from people with gray hair, people who've lived their life, okay? You'll never hear one of them saying this. Sonny, listen up. I've learned a lesson in life. I have a regret, and I don't want you to have the same regret. I just was not busy enough in life, and I did not commit to enough things, and I did not go to work enough. You'll never hear that, will you? Normally, it's like, I wasn't there enough for my family. I wish I would have spent more time with my children. I wish that the relationships and the most meaningful things in life, they've actually done surveys of, of elderly people. And, you know, if you could live life over, you could give, give advice to, to young people. What would you say? And they say, relationships. That's what we're talking about here. Well, back to our story. God um, called us in 2014, so after all these other steps, 
He called us to full-time ministry, called Scott out of the classroom altogether. But as a stay-at-home mom, this was at the point where, you know, you hear your husband say, you know, I'm going to quit my teaching job. I'm going to go into ministry full-time, and it's going to be financially self-supporting. That idea was a little scarier. For me, it was absolutely terrifying. But seeing how God had worked in our family and had called us step by step and just all these providential um, events that had happened really just showed us that his, his plan for us was, was his plan and that we could trust him in the rest. But Cammie thought that was scary. This is where it gets yeah. really scary. The words echo from the past and the chills that went down the spine. The words country living. Maybe to many people it's like idyllic. This is a, that's kind of how I felt. Like, yeah, this is the thing. This is the thing. Um, I read the book Country Living. I'm like, look at this, honey. Look at this. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do the do the country living thing. And, you know, we're, we're not gonna have a full time job anymore. So we're gonna grow our own food. And um, excuse me, right? Appropriate response, by the way. Like, gotta balance each other out here. But um, you know, there is a quote that says, "Poverty in many cases." And this doesn't mean like you know, lack of clean drinking water and dysentery and you know, like extreme poverty. But but some deprivation. Poverty, in many cases, is a blessing, for it prevents youth and children from being ruined by inaction. So we were like, I mean, the Lord has provided for us. We're not in that situation where it's just like, oh, no, how are we going to eat? But we thought we could be. And so we ended up country living. I mean, that's a scary thing at this point in the story. Yeah, Scott was really excited about it. Um, bless his heart. We, don't, <laughs> we didn't know how to grow anything. We did not know what we were doing. Um, and for me, if I'm honest, and it's embarrassing to say, but I really like the conveniences of suburban living. You know, we had our little play dates with Levi's little baby friends, and I had my mom's groups, and I had Target and the grocery store around the corner, and Grandma was just a call away. You know, life was easy. It was fun. It was simple. But that conviction was creeping in on me. After Scott read Country Living, he passed on to me, and you cannot read that book without being convicted about it. And I was. And just the thought of being out in the country as a family, working together, playing together, being out in nature together, exploring life together, was just really attractive. And at the same time, the hustle and the bustle and the noise and the cement and the everything, the smog of the city was becoming less and less attractive. And we knew that God was calling us to homeschool our kids in the country at that point. That's, that was one of the steps where people really looked at us weird and they were like, It's true. Really? What are you guys doing? Tell them the story about Judy real quick. Oh, well, I... I read Country Living and I was convicted and I had an older friend who, she's kind of like my mom, and she was really concerned for me and kind of in a, Cami, I don't think you're going to You guys are going a little it. overboard yeah. now. <laughs> well, and she said it very nicely, but you know, she's like, you know, you're a social person and you're going to be alone and that's going to be hard and Scott travels and being by yourself with the kids and it's just really far and you know, she was genuinely concerned for me. And I, I heard her out, and I said, Judy, have you read Country Living? And she's like, no. And I was like, just do me a favor. Just read Country Living. Tell me what you think. You know, I thought, maybe I'm crazy. So I gave her Country Living. She read it. She gave it back to me. She's like, you're right. You should move to the country. <laughs> she said something like, we're all supposed to be going that direction yeah, she, or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, when people look at your family and the decisions that you make to, to try to do the together thing more and more and more, the world is doing the opposite, right? I mean, the families are being fractured and splintered, and people, every, even if you're married and you've got the family in place, still everybody's going different directions. And you got, you know, full time public schooling and worldly media, and the screens and the schools of the world are basically raising the children of this generation. And parents are satisfied to outsource their, their parenting to these agencies of the world, to the worldly schools and the worldly media. And so when you start saying things like Cammie said, you know, we're moving into the country, we're going to do the homeschool thing. And the world looks at that and says, that's, that's odd. That's strange. I mean, aren't you afraid you're sheltering your children? And I, 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 as I thought about that word shelter, you know, there's some spirit of prophecy counsel that says we are to put a sacred shield around the home to protect from contaminating influences. And that that's how you influence the world. I have all those quotes. I think I might have actually done that very same quote here last year. So I won't repeat it, plus I don't have it in front of me anyway. But the, the gist is, put a, put, put, a, put a barrier between yourself and the world so that you can show the power and influence of, of the power of Christian influence to the world. I'm scratching my head at that point, and I'm going, okay, how does this work? You're distinct. You're set apart. The Bible says we are to be a peculiar people. You do things differently and more differently from the world, 
And somehow that's going to influence the world. How does that work? Because conventional wisdom says the only way you influence the world is you go and jump in bed with the world, be immersed in the worldliness, and then when you're in that setting, then you can have an influence. But the quote says you have a firm barrier between you and the world, and that's how you show the power of influence. Well, it works like this. When there's a difference between God's people and the world, then questions start being asked. Why are you guys doing it that way? And, and hopefully a positive manifestation is happening and not just peculiar in the sense that, you know, we wear a funny hat or something weird and they're like, why do you do that? But something good, something beautiful starts to come out of the together principle in the home. And when people start seeing that there's more joy, there's more relational connectedness, there's more hope, ah, then what the apostle Peter said comes into play. Be ready to give an answer for when people ask you about the hope that you have. So when you think about, well, we're going to be weird, we're going to be weird, and what are people going to think of us? That's something we've had to struggle with. I mean, your extended family and all of that. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> if you're following the Lord's ways and you're standing upon the word of God, you know that the truth of God's ways will triumph and people will see the validity, the value of this. Can I tell you a quick story about a, a lady we know? whose sister is of that mindset, okay? Her sister is, we're going to do things God's way. We're going all in and everything she reads, we're like, we're gonna really try and do this. And she's really trying to follow the steps the Lord is leading her in, okay? That's, that's, that's the lady here, okay? But, but she's got a sister who is agnostic in the world and, and not, not Christian at all. She thinks this mom Who's, who's raising her kids in the country, and they're doing this thing. We know this lady. Her sister thinks she's crazy, right? It's like, whoa. Um, and, and they've had conversations where it's like, man, there, there's, there's very little common ground here, and it's really, really, really hard. Well, fast forward after, uh, two years, three years after conflict and awkwardness, and man, are we ever having an influence on the sister here? Is this ever going to bear any fruit? Couldn't possibly in, be influencing them. They think we're crazy. Well, this um, secular-minded sister becomes pregnant. And she's got friends who have kids who are raising their kids the worldly way on average. And, and, and their kids are just struggling. They're, just, they're not as happy. They're not polite. They come over. They, they're jumping off the walls. And the sister says, I don't want my kids to be like my friend's kids. And guess who she asks for parenting advice? Her weird sister over here, right? She says, how, how are your kids happy? I mean, can you give me some tips? And not that our kids are perfect by any means, but, um, you know, she's looking at those ones and they're like, ah, this is chaos. This is not fun at all. Goes to the sister for advice. I messed that up, didn't I? <laughs> some of you know how. Oops. So back to our story. That was the one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made from the platform, but... We're the Lord on. will help me with that. The Lord the, will help me with that. The, I, go the ahead, honey. term together for us. <laughs> can't leave me up here alone. <laughs> when we decided to do the country living thing, the term together really became real for us. We were uh, figuring out life together. We were trusting God for our finances together. We were raising our little family together. And we were trying to figure out this country living thing together. And there wasn't a challenge that we weren't tackling together as a team. So then we decided, or we thought, hey, why don't we take the next logical step? Dad travels for a living, so why don't we go with him, now that Silas, our baby, is no longer a baby, why don't we go with him as much as possible? Which, of course, means as much as mom can handle. And then we could be together, even on the road. Now, of course, this part of our story of the traveling is unique to us and God's unique calling for us. But the principle that stands for all of us is to spend as much time as possible with your children. But then Scott upped the ante a little bit, or a lot. We had done a little bit of traveling, you know, a weekend here, maybe a week of prayer there, just a little bit of traveling together. And then he had this dream idea. And I know some of you are married to dream idea men, the big idea guys. And he thought... Let's not just go for a weekend. Let's not go for a week. Why don't we buy a motor home, plan a trip that covers 15 states, and just be on the road for seven weeks straight? Well, we did it, 
and it was crazy, and it was definitely adventure, but it was really monumental for our family. In fact, it was while we were on that trip that we came up with our family motto, together, together, together. It just seemed to fit perfectly for us since we were spending so much time together naturally, living on top of each other in a 23-foot motorhome, spending hours on the road. It just kind of matched our lifestyle, and it seemed to fit with what we were wanting to do as a family. It was also a reminder that we wanted to do everything together as a team, not be split up, not to do different things, but to be together as much as possible. And there were challenges on that trip, but we were together, and we were stronger for it. Challenges <laughs> understates the case significantly. Can I, can I tell you a quick story? We were ready to hit the road, right? We're from Michigan. I don't know if I mentioned that. We're from Michigan. And um, yeah, we're from right there, middle of the mitten. And um, we needed to get south quickly in December because um, there was a weather forecast and, and, and we had a plan. Okay, so the plan was, what was this, like Sunday or something? And we were going to leave on Tuesday. She knows the exact dates. Details. Awesome. Thank you. I need you up here all the time when I'm doing presentations where I'm like, I don't know if I got that detail right. But um, you couldn't have bailed me out of that last one. I just, I just totally messed that up. But, um, so we were going to leave on Tuesday. It's Sunday. And we're planning on spending Monday packing the RV and getting ready to go. But um, this is December in Michigan. We're, we're about to head south, and it's, you know, fair, fair weather at that point for Michiganders. You know, we can handle a little bit, but then the weather forecast comes on. It's one of these crazy-sounding weather forecasts where, where, where you read, and it's like, the snow apocalypse is upon us. Hide the kids. Hide the dog. You know, stockpile food. You know, it's going to be the worst storm in history. <laughs> so we got a little startled by that, and we said... Um, Okay, we got to get down to like Indiana or middle Indiana before the storm hits because it's going to be ice. They said the roads are going to be ice, and we didn't want to ice skate our way down to the south on our, in our RV. So we, we got to get down to Indiana where it will be rain. And so that means we're leaving like now, like tomorrow morning. It's Sunday evening, and we have to leave Monday morning because the storm is coming through by Monday noon. And... Okay, so here's what we do. We're going to bed. We're going to sleep for a couple hours. We're going to wake up basically in the middle of the night, pack the motor home, and then when it's time for the kids to get up, we throw them in the RV and we are out of there. Okay. Now, I, I'm guessing that in your marriages, you typically have two people that tend to become attracted to one another. The opposites attract, right? And, and one is, tends to be more organized and, and, and tidy and orderly than the other. And Cammy is that organized person. If she had it her way and she had the time, she'd probably spend a week organizing the motorhome before it's time to leave. She nodded. I, was, I thought I was exaggerating, but are you just being nice to me? So anyway, um, she says, sounds about right. Uh, and and, and th now there's zero time to organize it. I mean, we're just throwing our stuff into it. And this is our first trip in it. We're still figuring out how this machine works and the battery and the charging and all of this. And, and I don't know, I'm not a very mechanical guy, so I, I don't know what's going on in this thing. So it's total, like, chaos and nervousness and, 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 and nothing's in its place and um, it was really 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 hard and so when Cammie says challenges um, you know this phrase together 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 it sounds really nice like oh this is a, a nice perfect happy family who has a great motto and you know, like, like, did you appreciate the sermon this morning, by the way? I, I needed that encouragement where it's like you, you feel like a failure, right? This together, together, together concept comes out of adversity, conflict, uh, a situation we found ourselves in where it didn't bring the best out of us. We could have conquered that by the Lord's strength. I'm not making excuses, but we found ourselves in that situation. And uh, happy the home was the last thing that you would describe this uh, beginning, the first few weeks of this trip as. So together, together, together was the, the, the phrase that came out of that when we're like, we're a team. We're a family. Enough conflict. Enough of us just being rude and short with each other. And at the end of that trip, by the way, we did finally get the place organized. <laughs> found, a, found a day to go to Walmart and buy some bins and storage things and all that kind of stuff. And I, I spent a day with the RV organizing it. Like, it proved that I actually do have the ability. Oh, she said she was so yeah. proud. Um, I, I, I showed all my cards because now it's expected, right? Because I actually can do it. 
And after spending like that day going and doing all this, and I'm going to do, we're going to do it this way and this way, you know, I actually have the ability to organize things and space, um, which, which now I, I have some accountability to, to meet that standard, which is probably a good thing. But the, the next few weeks after that were, were, were more of a joy, tough, hard, right? I mean, for, for Cammie, it, easy, easier uh, experience would be just being at home. And, you know, a lot of people like travel for a vacation, like for us, vacation is not having to travel because <laughs> travel is work for us. And, and when we do it, it's, 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 it's just strain and it's stressful and it's hard. But um, I asked her at the end of the trip, honey, do you want to do this again next winter? Um, and, and basically the, the answer and the consensus for both of us was it was hard, but it was worth it together, together, together. It was hard, but it was worth it. And I'm sure you've said phrases like that as you've made decisions in your life, you know, you don't necessarily choose the easy path, do you? The road to life is narrow. It's an uphill and steep climb, dangerous precipice and difficult ascent. The road to destruction is broad. It's easy. You're going with the flow. But you've said in your own life, I'm sure, about certain decisions that have been made that manifested themselves and the fruit God was bringing. It didn't make any sense at the time, but in the end, you're looking at that and you're going, there's more joy there's more fulfillment, even though it was hard. It was worth it. Scott, by the way, forgot to mention a phrase on our notes where he uh, mentions that he heard once that um, the term RV stands for ruined vacation, <laughs> which Scott says, well, it wasn't a vacation. It was a ministry trip. Well, ruined whatever, but Especially for somebody who doesn't know what they're doing with mechanical things. Yeah. It's uh, a, lot, a lot of chaos waiting to happen. We learned a lot. So we extended the trip from seven we did. to ten weeks this past winter. Yeah, and it was, the trip was hard, but not hard enough to convince us to not try it again. So we did try it again this year. We extended it, uh, made it a little bit longer, ten weeks. Added some morning sickness, which was a whole other source of fun. But we, had the, we overcame the challenges together, which was the point. Now, since most of you live most of your lives, as we do, at home, not on the road, we wanted to discuss how the together, together, together lifestyle can work at home. There's a phrase that we like to use in our family, and that is just the phrase, doing life together. It's simple, but it means so much. You know, kids can spend their whole day working with their mom, doing gardening or housework. They can do their uh, homeschool work or their homework with their siblings, with their parents. They can help daddy with their work too. And of course, every family, family situation is unique, but the principle for all of us is that you want to spend as much time as possible together and do as much together. In fact, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9, lays that out. It says that parents should teach their children as they rise up, as they lay down, which sounds like morning and evening worship to us, as you sit, we'll talk about mealtime in a minute, and as you walk by the way. In other words, as you live life together. There are so many opportunities to teach, to train, to guide your children when you're just living life together side by side, doing those everyday things. And you really get to know your kids, their joys, their sorrows, their strengths and weaknesses when you spend an enormous amount of time with them. You know, we're talking throughout the day. We experience their highs and their lows together. And those of you with little ones, you know, the highs are really high and the lows are really low, but you're experiencing them together. You're making memories and you're there to answer all the questions. And if your house is like ours, there are a lot of questions that you can't answer. But the bottom line is that the family is creating a deeper and deeper bond every day just by doing life together. I don't have time to recite all of the quotes, but there's a number of just wonderful, wonderful quotes that capture this. It says, keep these children with you. It says, give them something to do. A um, good friend of mine, Joshua White, his booth is right over there on the corner, actually, a thinking generation, talks about that at great length. Just, you know, this concept of doing life with your children prior to age seven, that those early years and the character development that takes place when you're just with your kids. And, and, and they enter into, as Cammy said, the, uh, the, the work, the, the play, just, just um, enter into life with the parents. I don't know where I am on the notes right now. <laughs> Well, I'll jump in for a second. Okay. There's another quote that's in this paragraph. It says, let them have the joy of supposing they help you. And those of you with little ones, like that's your entire day is like, thank you for helping mom, right? As you're cleaning up the mess they made. Um, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, that's, that's, like that's that good. One. I'm skipping stuff all over. So thank you for catching. <laughs> so, you know, maybe a better name for this session 
um, rather than being together, 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 that you could call this session doing life together. You know, that looks kind of weird with us. Being on the road and in ministry decisions and career decisions, that's a unique thing. But for all of us, we can incorporate that concept of doing life together as a family. Wonderful message. Um, I think it was Thursday night. Um, seize the moments. This idea of, of we've, got, we've got only so much time together as with our children before they're, before they're out of the nest. And so that, that concept of every possible opportunity to be together as a family. And also the purpose, the, to the aim of that, it's actually laid out. Cammie um, uh, paraphrased it in Deuteronomy 6. But what Deuteronomy 6, when it says parents should teach these things to their children as they rise up and as they lie down and as they walk by the way and as they, as they um, sit. sit and all of these things. Thank you. The main reason to do that is it, it has just laid out the Ten Commandments in the previous chapter in Deuteronomy 5. And then it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And it says, Parents, then, teach these things to your children. So what is the purpose of doing life together? It's to transmit the faith and the values and the love of God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and the commandments of God to bind them to their Savior. That's really the whole purpose of this talk, doing life together so that when we're bound together with our kids and we're connected to our Savior, it creates an indissoluble link where the children are then connected to their Lord. I love this story about our oldest son just talking about doing life together. There was a time that he had helped me with some job, and so I thanked him for being a, good, being a good helper, and I said, I loved having you with me on this job. And he looked at me, and he was kind of confused, and he said, Mom, I'm always with you. I was like, that's true enough, and it made me laugh, but I love that that's his normal, right? That's the only thing he knows is being with his mom, being with his family all the time. Now, parents, this isn't only about, you know, bringing your kids along with you as you live your day and checking things off your own to-do list. But uh, there's a great book available at the RI booth called The Connected Family. And in there, there's a chapter that talks about the benefits of doing what the kids like to do and what they're interested in. So kids, don't stop asking your parents to do stuff with you. For myself, I personally wouldn't choose to play with Legos if I had free time. But my Speak for yourself. <laughs> My six-year-old would, and so I do a lot of Legos at home. I'm getting better and better at it every time. And our boys love to play hide-and-seek. We didn't play a lot of hide-and-seek before we had kids, um, but now we play it all the time. You know, it's a go-to activity for our family. The boys always love it, and we kind of roll our eyes like, really, like, hide-and-seek is going to make your day. And for some reason it does, and so we do it. But anyway, it's what they're interested in, and it really makes their day. One of the favorite games for the, the five and three year old, now six, but um, our, our little ones like the game stuck. And basically, it, it is what it sounds like, stuck. You got, you got trucks, one of them gets stuck, and the other one comes and tows it out. And that's, that's something Cammie played, and endless repeat. rounds of stuck. Yes. Yeah, and over and over and over and over. And um, you, know, you get your idea of what you want to do, right? We were on a hike just on the way down here. It was um, after our, our stop in Missouri, and we, um, we were, we, uh, in my mind, we're going on a hike, right? And this is, this is serious business. Yes, we're having fun as a family, enjoying nature, but, but I've, I've got goals with my hiking to, to, to encourage my children's physical development and growth. And if they can hike this many miles, then they can grow to that. And so I've got this idea about what we're going to do on this hike with, with, with the, the two children. Well, the three-year-old doesn't necessarily view it that way, right? The three-year-old has got all sorts of different games and ideas of, of what he wants to do. And so, uh, what's that? Mostly stuck. In fact, that was the only thing that it was just games of stuck where, where I'm on the trail and now I'm stuck over here. It's actually a good way to get him to catch up with us because he'd run with his to himself. He's going to tow me right out of there. You know, of course, it, the, the hike would not have been nearly as fun if we were like, come on, you got you to keep up here, kid. You know, yeah, we, no, I'm not going to play any more stuck with you. Now, honestly, I got tired of it. Like, it's kind of draining doing things that just like are totally uninteresting to you. <laughs> At least when you're in maybe a, a selfish state of mind. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe you need to just enter into the joy of that child more. But I, I, I struggle with that because you get in your own world and your own mindset about that. And in fact, I, I learned that with my older son as well. We've been doing a lot together lately. We, we did the 10 weeks and came home and, and I, I had like, like uh, two, two speaking appointments where I, I had to go in between, and then we've been together on this whole trip, so it's been like together forever, doing all kinds of different things too. It's not just work where it's like just we're in the same room, but we're all in different places. Like that can happen too, right? You can be together, but you're not really fully present with each other, right? 
And, and I'm not just talking about being on phones. I mean, that, of course, if you're with a thousand friends on, well, Cammie, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, also, you can just be busy. You can just be tuned out to the people around you. Um, but we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun things. And I, I, my heart kind of broke a little bit just yesterday when my son said to me, Dad, uh, we were listening to a message about Tom Waters said, you know, when he was, a, his, his kids were in the house and, and they'd come and say, hey, daddy, can we play? And he's like, oh, you know, I'm working. And, and, and he, would, he would drop his things and he would go play with them. And, and my, my son said to me right then, he said, dad, I feel like you haven't been playing with me much lately. I'm like, I'm glad he said that. You know, he wasn't doing it rudely, but I was just like, what do you mean? We've done so many fun things. Like we got these, who gave us that Velcro ball? And it's like, you know, the, 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 the flat thing with the Velcro and the tennis ball and you throw that and catch that. And we, we've done all sorts of different things. And I, and I was like, what do you mean, buddy? We were doing the Velcro ball and this and this and this. And he's like, but you haven't played trucks with me. And I'm like, you didn't ask me, the trucks never came up. But in his little mind, in his way of viewing this, the fact, that's his love language, Cammy just whispered to me. I mean, that's, that's his mindset about it. It's not my idea. Like, I have an, I'd rather play throw and catch with the ball because that's important for development through eye-hand coordination. And I got my agenda here, right? <laughs> but he, he wants to play trucks, and I didn't even know that because I didn't bother to say, hey, buddy, what do you want to do for fun? What, like, like I taught on Thursday, right? It's very awkward to teach on this topic. It really is. But um, the, 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 the counselor, the lady who said, spend 15 minutes a day, and that's not much time, but you know, this is a good start for people who are just bit too busy for each other. She said, to, she said to parents who'd come into her counseling office and their kids are all struggling with misbehavior, she says, I'm not gonna tell you the, the, the procedure for punishment and all of this, just go home and spend 15 minutes with each child, both you and your husband, 15 minutes per day doing something that the child wants to do. So asking our kids, what do you wanna do? So it's not just about together, but really, really entering into their heart and their, their loves and what, they, what Cammie's going to say right now. Yeah. Well, doing what your child wants to do or is interested in, you know, shows them that what is interesting to them is interesting to you. So, you know, you try really hard to make stuck and playing with trucks interesting to you. And that in turn shows them that they are interesting to you. And it kind of goes without saying that when you spend time with someone and you show interest in them and what they're interested in, it fosters a relationship. And there's no more relationship more important on this earth than that with your kids and showing interest in their lives. And that relationship is key not only because that's how they connect with their savior, but also it helps them to develop. Proper development will not take place if children are separated from their parents. I mean, we separate our kids at an early age from their parents and put them in schools at early ages in our culture. That's just the, the run of the course. Nobody really questions and thinks about waiting till age eight or 10 or home education or any of these concepts. And so our culture today has a drastic uh, deficit in what, what they call emotional intelligence, EQ, just, just, or, or, or security, confidence, uh, self, self, a sense of, of your, own, your own validity. And, and so people have insecurity problems and they have loneliness and they have depression and they have anxiety. And all these things are through the roof. And really when it comes down to it, Deuteronomy 6 has the answer to all of these social ills and all of our problems and struggles. It's together, doing life together. Now, I want to get, I don't want to, but I will get a little personal here for a minute. You know, an area where a lot of people aren't together with their families is the area of media. You know, there are so many ways and methods and devices out there to entice us away from the, the relationships that are the most meaningful, that matter the most. Did you just say devices to entice? Did you notice the double entendre there? Right. Did I say the French right? Double. Anyway, can we speak? <laughs> we'll talk about it later. I, I won't interrupt you anymore. So for a long time, I really struggled with my use of Facebook. It's embarrassing to say. I just spent way too much time on there, you know, looking at people's pictures, checking out what they were doing, and just spending time on their lives. And it was distracting at best, and at worst, it caused me to compare myself with them. And 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says that those who compare themselves among themselves are not wise. I would either feel prideful that I was doing something better than someone else, or usually I would feel worse about myself, that my life wasn't as fun or as easy or as pretty as someone else's. And it was destructive and it was depressing. Now, social media advocates, of course, will tell you that you'll be so happy when you interact with your hundreds of friends online, right? Well, they're wrong. Studies have shown that the more media you consume, the less happy and the more bored you are. 
Now, some people can find a balance with their social media, and for me, it was just, it was too hard. I was just failing too much, and it was really unhealthy for me, relationally unhealthy, spiritually unhealthy, emotionally unhealthy. I want to repeat that, too. The more media you consume, the more bored you are. Like, we go to that media for entertainment to, to kind of give us a pick-me-up, but people who use a lot of media are actually more bored. Kaiser Family Foundation 2010 study found. And they're less happy. Social media users, heavy social media users. I mean, there's a balance for many people on this. Cammie has her own personal testimony on this. But for some people who are finding the balance, they would, not, they would not qualify for this statistic. But heavy social media users, heavy Facebook users are 2.7 times more likely to be depressed than the average person. 2.7 times more. That's not like 25% increase. I mean, this is 100 plus percent increase chances for depression. If you're scrolling that endless Facebook feed all the time, seeing how much happier everybody else is than you and so on. Yeah. And that certainly rang true for me. I wasn't clinically depressed or anything, but being on Facebook was definitely stealing joy from my life. And more importantly, it was stealing time from my family. So I decided last year to do a shorter fast and it was awesome. I just felt so free. So then later in the year, I just gave it up altogether. And I can honestly say that I have not missed it a bit. I just, I feel like a burden is lifted off my shoulders. I have more time. I'm happier. I'm sure my family's happier. Scott nags me to be off my phone less. <laughs> that was it, not in the notes. It's true. <laughs> I'm so vulnerable right now. <laughs> Anyway, we got to stop hanging around these waters and rains. Or, you know, they, they, they do such a good job at that. It's not my natural uh, way, but the Lord's what, working on me. Being touchy feeling? Just, feeling? yeah, yeah, so vulnerable, so <laughs> real. Up. I just like present information, right? Yeah, let's all go out of here and, and, and do it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so I'm happier now being off Facebook. And, of course, I'm always the last person to hear about stuff, but I can handle that. Deuteronomy 6, again, you know, as you rise up and lie down, as you sit, sit. Um, what is that talking about? Have you ever read in Psalm 128, verse 3? It says, thy children will be like olive plants round about thy what? Do you know? Thy table. Your children are growing up and maturing as they wind about. You can imagine the imagery of the olive plants growing up round about thy table. Well, the place for meals, of course. Parents, teach these things to your children as you rise up and lie down and walk by the way as you sit. That's an admonition that mealtime is very, very important. You're familiar with the name Steve Jobs? Probably, yeah. The founder, CEO of Apple, former. And um, he was asked in an, in an interview by a journalist right before the iPad was about to be released. And it was this big rollout and a lot of marketing behind it. And they're like, let's talk to the guy, right? Steve Jobs. And wow, your kids must be really into this thing. The iPad, the iPad, the iPad. What do your kids think of it? Steve Jobs said, actually, my kids haven't used them. And they're like, what are you talking about? This is the Jobs household. This is Apple headquarters, right? You must have like mountings on the wall with every device at an arm's reach all around you, swirling and screens. And he said, no, actually, my kids have never used them. And we, he went on to say, we have meals together. So they, what do you do? Well, we have meals together. And we don't have devices at the meals. We talk. Like radical concept in our culture today, but it, it is. It really is. We talk. We have conversations about what's going on in the world and have some meaningful, meaningful things together. So on the meals topic. Well, at our family, in our family, at our meals, I just love to talk with the boys and ask them questions about their day, what their favorite part was, or their highs or their lows of the day, something they're looking forward to. And, you know, as a mom of little kids, you figure you know your kids, you know what they're going to say, and it's almost, you know, just kind of routine to ask those questions. But they say stuff that surprises me all the time, kind of gets you into their brain a little. Um, often we'll share news or announcements at the table. We just be together as a family. It can be a really special time, and it's also very important for training manners, for training proper social etiquette at Did the table. Did you see how she just looked at me right there? <laughs> I know what he's going to say. You're, you're actually done with your part, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Pastor Holland knows exactly what I'm talking about probably. My wife's Canadian. And, um, I, I, you know, 
I, I, I thought, you know, this is, this is a novel thing. This is nice. This is until I started having meals with this beautiful Canadian. Because I don't know if you're aware of this, but Canadian children are subjected to a very unique form of, uh, of etiquette training at the table and manners training. If a child is seen breaking one of the manners rules that, you know, for proper citizens of the Commonwealth, you, you know, they've got the Queen of England. They're under the monarchy here up in Canada. And, and I'm kind of thankful we threw off the shackles and no more kings and right here in America. I'm wet, red, white, and blue. And I used to teach American history. We joke about that stuff. But um, the parents, many of them, who, who really are in touch with their Britishness, they will say to the children, now, what would the queen think of you if she saw you eating like that? Like, that was so foreign to me as an American. Like, so she started saying that kind of thing. I'm like, the queen? The first time she tried that on me? No, really, I have had to undergo some proper etiquette training for anybody, not just for Canadians, British, or anybody. But uh, maybe you know what I'm talking back about back there, Paula. The, the, the queen of England, she would come, and she, maybe she's got, like, uh, an intelligence operation out there like it, mom is the queen really going to come to our house yes she if, might if you someday never know. you are eating with the queen we want you to have proper etiquette here so anyway very important tom I, I, i'm not sure i'm not sure tom and uh, his son would have gotten away with digging right in and piling up the plates <laughs> like like he mentioned the other day uh the yeah. indiscretions there the queen would have been very disappointed in you tom <laughs> I'm sure she's a very nice lady. <laughs> yeah. The other, besides meals, another important time, the most important time as a, to spend time together as a family is family worship. Now, did you know that less than one in 10 born again Christian homes ever read the Bible together in a given week? And less than one in 10 born again Christian homes ever praise together except at mealtime? Now, I know our kids love reading Bible stories. And those last few minutes of the day where we tuck them in and we pray with them, it's such a special time of the day. It's a highlight. We look forward to it all evening. So eating together, worshiping together, praying together, all those things will bind you together as a family like nothing else. And it's not just evening and morning worship either. It's all day. You're connecting with Christ as a family, uh, with your kids, all throughout the day. We have a really neat set of friends, a dear family that we love, that are really, really intentional about their time with their daughter. Whether they're working in the garden or going for a hike or going to the zoo, which are all things we did with them while we were staying in their home, they're always bringing their daughter's mind back to Christ. They're either practicing their memory verses or singing scripture songs or talking about object lessons as they, you know, look around them throughout the day. And it's just really inspiring. Our friend, actually, the mom, she always has a backpack with her. And in it, she's got like little, you know, note cards and flip charts and different papers and song sheets. And she's always ready. You know, it's not like, well, I don't really, can't really think of anything to do. So we'll just talk about nothing. No, she's intentional. And it's awesome. And we are so inspired when we spent that week with them. They're our heroes, really. That is an actual friend of ours. So. Yes. <laughs> now, we've, we've talked a lot about being, I'm glad only a few people laughed at that. That's a good sign. Now, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about being physically together, right? As you rise up, lie down, sit, evening worship, meals, everything, doing life together. But, um, you know, there's also being emotionally together, having the togetherness in our hearts, like actually liking each other, being nice to each other. So here are a few examples of not being emotionally together. Okay, so you have an excited dad, maybe like the dad in our house, who says, hey guys, let's go for a hike. And mom says, I have to do the dishes. Or one of the kids says, today was a good day. And their sibling says, except when we had to weed the garden. Or someone says, hey, grandma's coming today. And someone else says, no, she's not. She's coming tomorrow. Like none of those things, first of all, are nice. And they're not even helpful, right? It just brings a spirit of discord and disunity to the home. Have you ever noticed sometimes the first word in your sentence is setting the tone? And a lot of times certain words will pop up unnecessarily and, and somebody says something and then somebody else in the room just says, actually, and then finish the sentence. Like, was that completely necessary? Or, uh, well, um, we'd like to do this. Well, you know, it, it's these words, sometimes we've noticed a, a disproportionate number of them appearing. No inherent evil in the words, actually, or well. But we want to be careful with how we use this. Uh, in our home, we, we've begun to talk about uh, when, when we notice that one of us is being contrary to the other instead of agreeable. We don't want to be 
contrary in our homes to one another. We want to be agreeable in our words and in our tones of voice. So what if you really have to do the dishes? Well, you know, if dad says, hey, let's go for a hike, you could, instead of saying, no hike, I'm doing the dishes, you could say, hey, that sounds great, dad. Hey, why don't we work together and get the dishes done first? Or if grandma is indeed coming tomorrow and not today, their sibling could say, my beloved sibling, isn't grandmother coming tomorrow? <laughs> maybe, maybe a little over the top, but the point that was stands. Good. That was good. <laughs> We'd have a really happy home if we talked like that. You want to be positive in your language. You want to avoid pessimism, negativity. Just leave all that outside. Leave it somewhere else. And sometimes you have a negative thought. You don't have to say it. And I'm speaking to myself. You know, you just bite your tongue. Keep that thought. Um, take it captive. You won't regret saying something negative. And along these same lines, we have um, uh, in our family just an a analogy or, that yeah. we talk about, yeah. um, about being on the same road as mom and dad. So, you know, for two little boys who love anything vehicle, trucks, tractors, anything with wheels, really, if you have two vehicles on the same road together, you know, they'll end up at the same destination. And so we remind them, hey, are you on the same road as mom? Are you, you know, of the same mind as dad? And lately we've um, upgraded it to a truck and trailer. We're really into trailers right now. So a trailer is like literally attached to the truck. And so wherever that truck goes, that trailer will go too. And you'll have a successful trip, assuming they're uh, actually together. Yeah, Levi uh, just updated that one with me. We were talking through that and he said, can I be on an ATV with a chain attached? So then I'm steering and, and going the same direction. It's like, yeah, yeah, I like that analogy. That's the first you've heard of it. But you know, he's got to steer in our direction. As we close, in the book of Malachi, um, the last verse of the Old Testament, the very last verse of the Old Testament is a prophecy. And in this prophecy, it gives a, a, a great hope. And in vo chapter 4, verse 6, the very last prophecy of the Old Testament actually is talking about the family. It says that before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, God will turn the hearts, do you know this verse? God will turn the hearts of the fathers to and toward the hearts of the children and the hearts of the children toward the hearts of the fathers. And we would imply mothers as well. The family is being turned one toward another, which implies that in the last days, which direction are we turned to begin with? It's in the last days, we're going to need some turning. We're going to need some restoration of the family. Good name for a ministry, by the way. That's what this is all about, right? It's about us coming into unity. And, and we can be the fulfillment of this prophecy. Think about that. If we get this concept of together, 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 if we get this concept, speaking to myself right now, we can fulfill the last prophecy of the Old Testament, which is a prophecy pointing to the last days and a restoration of this institution called the family, where the hearts are turned one to another, where we do life together and where our hearts are wedded and knit together. Now, I don't know what that looks like in your home. God has probably already challenged you many ways this weekend, hopefully encouraged you and said that truth will triumph in your home. But as we have our reflection time, allow the Lord to continue to, to impress upon you what, what does this look like now for us tomorrow and next week and this year? What is together, together, together? What is Deuteronomy 6 doing life together? What does this mean in our lives? What decisions can we make to come into further unity and harmony in our homes to fulfill that Malachi 4 prophecy where the hearts can be turned one toward another? So... Ponder these things as we listen to the music.
Would you kneel with me as we pray? Our Father, we want our hearts turned to you, and we want our children's hearts turned to us as parents. And even as the children pray now, they want their hearts turned to the parents and the parents turned to the children. Each one of us wants to be united together and together with you. Please give us wisdom on how to apply practically in our own unique station in life the principles that you've laid down in Deuteronomy 6. How we can truly love you with all our heart, and soul, and mind, and strength. Cling to these commandments and talk about them with our children as we rise up and lie down, as we walk by the way, as we sit. We pray for clarity, for decision, and for joy, knowing that truth will triumph. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.